and we're joined today by Professor Russell Death. Um, he's a professor of freshwater ecology at Massey University um, and has been doing quite a bit of work with beef and lamb around um, our farm planning and in particular this stream health check. Uh, thank you very much. Um, so I'm a professor of freshwater ecology. I've been at Massey for 30 years now and been doing research in freshwater ecology now for quite some time and I guess the the focus of the research that I've done more recently is moved away from the traditional academic science to trying to communicate that science um, in re reasonably easily understood ways to farmers and iwi groups so that they can use a lot of the science. I probably don't need to um, make you all aware that issues around water quality in New Zealand have come to the fore uh, in the last few years and we have lots and lots of science going back about you know 30 odd years around that but I think we've got less um, science around how to communicate that science to users such as farmers and to allow them to use it uh, on their land to to improve things. Um, next slide. And I, a lot of that has really been driven, I think, by a lot of public pressure around the state of uh, water quality. Um, it's really been declining um, over the last 20 years, um, and a lot of it has been linked with, with changes in agriculture. As a result of that, uh, a lot of the public have been come quite concerned around that, and in turn, that's put pressure on politicians to do something about it. And so there have been various endeavours from national and local government to try and improve the situation. And one of those is the National Policy Statement of Freshwater Management, um, which I had a small part in. in. Um, that was released uh, in August 2020. Um, and I guess one of the consequences of that for farmers, um, well, the number of consequences, a lot of, a lot of rules, again, around how you can graze your paddocks, but I think one of the most um, concerning issues for a lot of farmers is the fact that you'll now need to have this farm freshwater plan, and that has to be approved by some agency linked with MFE or MPI. They were, were they due to actually let us know what was going to be required um, by the middle of this year. Um, turns out that hasn't happened. so. We're still waiting uh, to see what MFE and MPI are going to require farmers to do in order to at least report on the state of waterways on their land. Um, and also, I think, link that in with the, the farm plan that, that, that you'll have. Um, Beef and Lamb ha have tried to front step that. And I've been working with a, a number of people at Beef and Lamb to develop ways that farmers can better understand the nature of their waterways and some of the things that they do on their land which affect those waterways. I think um, a lot of it is about education. I think if farmers know what things they're doing that might be having adverse effects, it's often really easy to, to change those uh, management activities and, and, and just little ways that can actually result in, in a better outcome. I hope also that it will provide an opportunity for farmers to um, report back to the public and that I don't believe that it is all farms around New Zealand that are impacting adversely on our waterways. I certainly think that many of the, the beef and lamb farms in particular are probably not um, adversely affecting their waterways as much as maybe some of the, the farming practices down on the lowlands. And it, I think it would be nice to kind of um, answer back to some of that public rhetoric around the state of waterways in farmland um, that is, you know, less intensively farmed. Next slide, please. I guess really the real biggest challenge that I often find in communicating the the, the, the state of our fresh waters is that, unlike many overseas countries, it's really hard to see the pollution in New Zealand. Many of the waterways in Europe and Asia and North America, um, some of them have radioactivity in them. Many of them are dyed red. Lots and lots of them are, are, are stock full with, you know, plastics and rubbish. And it's very easy to see that those waterways are polluted. 
in New Zealand, the two main pollution um, contaminants are too much nutrients and too much fine sediment. And so the, these pictures here of, are of you know, polluted waterways in New Zealand. But to many of us, we would see these as being just what our waterways look like. I think the one on the bottom right, anybody would conclude that's not a very healthy system. But even moderate levels of green algae growing on the bottom of streams is, is quite a strong indication that the, the health of that system is not very good. And when it comes to deposited fine sediment, uh, that's the, one of the, the second most um, detrimental impacts on freshwater ecology. And again, um, often when we have lots of rainfall like we've had at the moment, our waterways get um, a bit murky. And we just think of that as being the natural situation. A little bit of murkiness maybe is fairly natural, but because of what we've done to the land and the amount of erosion that is continuing to occur, when it rains, a lot of our waterways get far more muddy than, than they should be. Um, the turbidity itself is not such an issue, but what happens is that all of that sediment usually deposits down on the substrate, and that in turn affects the habitat where the fish and the invertebrates uh, are living. Next slide, please. So it can be challenging to work out whether your waterway on your farm is healthy or not. I think if you get a situation like this, you can see the one on the left is clearly quite polluted. The one on the right is, is clearly quite pristine and it's very easy to decide that the right one is really healthy and the left one is very unhealthy. Most farm waterways, however, are somewhere in between, and that's where it gets challenging. As I said, it's a little bit hard to know if your stream's got too much green slime on the bottom, or whether it's got too much murkiness and too much fine sediment. And so that's hopefully where the stream health check comes in. It's a relatively straightforward mechanism that farmers can use to go and put a score on how healthy their waterway is and then hopefully give some indication of what might be causing those problems. So the health of our waterways um, is a little bit, I think, like uh, human health. It's, it's relatively um, complex in that it involves looking at all of the different components. And I, and I think you know, understanding our health is something that is equivalent that we can probably comprehend a little bit easier than, than the health of, of a river. I often find that in you know the publicity around the health of fresh waters, one or two things are often you know highlighted. The nutrients in particular gets a lot of bad publicity, um, in that it, you know too much of it is bad for the health of a, a waterway. But there are lots of other things that can impact the health of the waterway, and it really requires all of those things to be working together in the right way in the right place. Just like with our health, um, if we feel sick. We'll often go to the doctor if you can manage to get an appointment. Um, hopefully when you get in there, the, the doctor will listen to your heart, listen to your lungs, take your temperature, probably measure your, your blood pressure, might send some um, blood samples off to get analysed. They won't just look at the one thing that you might be saying is at issue, they'll look at your whole health because all of those things around our health have to be working in order for us to be healthy and, and happy. Next click. Next slide. And um, if one of our organ systems happens to malfunction, so for example, if our lungs stop working, that uh, inevitably means that we're gonna get sick or potentially die. It doesn't matter that our heart is still healthy and our liver is still healthy and our kidney is still healthy. It only takes one of those components to stop working and we'll either get really sick or potentially die. Next slide. And river health is exactly the same. Um, as I said, often we hear in the media a lot around nutrients, but we need to have all of the different components of our um, river ecology working well um, in order for it to be a healthy system. And it only takes one of those to malfunction and that whole system can either become unhealthy or um, you can get a lot of the animals dying uh, or leaving the region. So we need, need to have the right levels of nutrients, the right levels of oxygen. We need to have good habitat quality, not too much fine sediments. 
we need to have the right amount of algae, so a little bit, because uh, it's the food for many of the, the insects which live there, but not too much. Um, we need to have the right invertebrates living in a particular type of river, and we also need to have the right top predators, things like fish and birds, which might be feeding on those uh, invertebrates. Next slide, please. And this is just a, a little pictorial demonstration of all of those different factors which are important to understanding whether a river is healthy or not. You know, as I said, we need to have the right levels of water chemistry, the right levels of nutrients. We also need to have good habitat quality. We certainly need to have the right amount of water in our, in our rivers. We also need to have floods as well. They're an integral part of river systems in New Zealand. And if we put a dam in and don't have those floods, it can have quite an adverse impact on the ecology. Not too much deposited sediment. We don't want any heavy metals. We also don't really want any pest species uh, to be in there. And hopefully if that system is working right, you'll have all of the correct components of that system, the, the macrophytes, the algae, periphyton, the invertebrates, fish, etc. So um, as I said, I'm a member of our local Hongana catchment care group, and we go out each month and collect water samples from about 11 sites uh, around our region. Now we send those off to the lab and they get analysed for, for water chemistry, uh, nitrate, phosphorus um, and ammonia. We also get the turbidity measured uh, and the amount of um, bacteria that are in that uh, water sample as well, the E. coli. And those are all important things to understand the kind of chemical composition of the water. But as I said before, it's only really one component of understanding the whole health of a waterway. We put it, go on to the next slide. So an example that I use to sort of illustrate this uh, are these pictures of cars on State Highway 1, just north of Wellington at Noronga Gorge. So these photos were taken at different times during the day. And you can see that at different times during the day, there are different numbers of vehicles on the road. Early in the morning when everybody's off to work, lots of vehicles. After everyone's at work, the number of vehicles drops off quite considerably until at around three and four, when people start collecting their kids from school, start heading home from work, the, the number of vehicles on the road increase again quite dramatically. And then again, they drop off uh, as everyone gets home, has their dinner and settles down to, to watch TV or whatever. The nutrient levels, the bacterial levels, whoops, a bit too early, thanks. <laughs> the, the nutrient levels, the um, sediment levels, the E. coli, they all have a similar kind of pattern to cars on the road. Throughout the day, you can have really high numbers and at other times of the day, really low numbers. If it rains, you can increase the numbers uh, or concentration of nutrients and bacteria. If there's been a long dry spill, the concentrations can go down. Different times of the year, you might have low levels and high levels. So you have a really high variability in the nutrients and the turbidity and the bacteria that you're measuring in those water samples um, throughout the year with those, those months, monthly collections. And so you really need to be doing that monitoring for at least three years to get some idea of what the background levels are in your waterway. Now the next slide. However, even when you do do that and you plot it out on a graph like this, you can see that it's highly variable. So these are the nitrogen concentrations in the Manawatu River collected by Horizons um, just as it enters uh, Palmerston North between 2006 and 2013. And you can see highly variable, goes all the way from 1.4 milligrams per litre to zero milligrams per litre of nitrogen. So it's really hard to kind of put a, a number on what the, the nutrient concentration is in the Manawatu River, even once you've collected that year, three years worth of samples. Um, as you can see, the thing that really characterises is how variable it is from month to month, and as I said, even within a single day, you can get a large change in the amount of variability. So it's, it's kind of hard to know whether the waterway on your farm has high levels of nutrients, or whether it's got low levels of nutrients, or it's got highly variable levels of nutrients. So as I said, we have um, attempted to provide a, a tool for farmers to be able to assess 
the state of their waterways that the stream health check and we're now going to focus more on how you go about using that um, to assess the, the the health of the, the water of your waterway um, just as there's a huge variety in uh, landowners and farms around New Zealand there's also a huge variety in waterways around New Zealand the stream health check is really developed to use on rivers and streams um, these are usually the things that are most often monitored by regional council scientists. Um, it's only fairly recent, recently that they've started to, to monitor lakes um, and certainly aren't monitoring ponds and dams. The assessment of those is much more challenging because the, the, the characteristics that you need to understand uh, are much more complicated in terms of the, the nutrient cycling, et cetera. So, um, the stream health check doesn't really apply to, to lakes and ponds, nor does it apply to wetlands. There are a few online tools that can help you understand what's in your wetland, but there are no assessment techniques that farmers can use or that regional councils can use to assess whether or not a, a wetland is healthy or not. So as I said, the stream health check really applies to rivers and streams. Um, it also applies to what some of you might consider to be ditches and races. Um, these are really just straightened streams um, in most cases. And although they might not look like your typical river or stream, they are in essence a, a river or stream. You've got water flowing through them and you've got animals which will be living in those. So although you might call them a ditch or a drain, um, as far as the animals and fish that might be living in them, are concerned uh, that's a river and a stream and so you can equally use the stream health check uh, for those straightened streams as you can for the, the more natural streams that uh, you might also have on your property. Next slide please. So using the stream health check it's a little bit less energy intensive than going out and collecting water samples although obviously if you're out collecting a water sample there's no reason why you can't do it you really only need to do the assessment once a year. And in fact, you probably only need to do it once every three years, unless you're doing something dramatic on your farm or you think this would be some major changes. It's unlikely that the stream health check score is gonna change dramatically from year to year. So it's a lot less labor intensive. You only need to do it once. It's much better to go out during low flow conditions. Um, the main reason for that, well, besides the fact that uh, it's a little bit safer and you won't get washed away in a flood event, is that uh, the algae and the invertebrates are much more likely to be present when you haven't had a big flood. Uh, the floods that we've had all recently around New Zealand will have washed away a lot of the algae um, and invertebrates might have also washed away a lot of the sediment. So the ideal time really is uh, Late summer, after you've had, hopefully, an extended period of low flows, the algae might be growing well, uh, the invertebrates will all be there chomping away at it as well. You also want to have a site that's easily accessible. Um, you don't need to go out into the deep, fast-flowing water. Um, not only can that be potentially dangerous, but most of the animals and plants aren't actually living out in that fast-flowing water. They're all on the edge. If you actually stand and look at a stream, you can you can see all of the algae growing along the edges. And as it kind of goes out into the deeper, faster water, you'll see that it gradually disappears. So there's no need to go out where it's really fast and deep and um, risk uh, drowning or falling in. Um, you simply can constrain yourself to the, the areas where it's perfectly safe to, to wander out. You only really need to have one monitoring site for each waterway on your farm. Um, and you really want to select something that you think is pretty representative of what that waterway looks like on your farm. It would, wouldn't make any sense to go and sample it uh, just as it enters your property. Ideally, I think you'd probably like to be sampling it when it's leaving your property and you know any of the impacts from the, the farming that you might have been doing uh, will be evident in, in that waterway. But I think it's, you know, it's pretty easy to, to figure out where a fairly representative spot is. You probably won't, don't want to have it directly downstream of a road crossing or anything that's obviously changing the nature of that waterway uh, dramatically. Just something that you think is 
fairly representative of the, the state of that waterway on your farm that you can easily get down to um, once a year. Next slide. So the stream health check itself uh, is quite straightforward. It's available on the Beef and Lamb website uh, to download, so you can download it uh, and print it out. Um, it's also available in the um, farm plan environmental modules that a number of you might have uh, had if you've been to any of the farm plan uh, workshops that Beef and Lamb have been running around the country. You can uh, put in the, the name of your stream, et cetera, the, the details. And it's basically a series of questions with uh, multi-choice answers. So next slide, please. So there are a whole series of questions and there's a multi-choice. You have a, a choice of four. Um, and so you look at the question. In this case, it's, are there invertebrates in my stream? What are the kinds of invertebrates that are that are actually present? So do you have lots of mayflies and stoneflies or do you have mostly snails and worms? Or do you have something that's halfway in between that? So from the four options that you have, you identify which one you think matches your stream most closely. So if we click the next button. So in this case, we have decided that the, the stream farm, the farm stream has a moderate number of mayflies and caddisflies, but also a number of other invertebrates as well. And associated with that is a score. And so each of the questions, once you've decided on what your multi-choice answer is, has a number associated with it. You go through and answer all the questions, and then you sum up all the, the scores and end up with a single number at the end. So next slide. So in essence, all you really need to um, fill in uh, the, the stream health check form is to actually have the form, have a, a nice safe place, as I said, that you can get down into the stream. If it's during winter, you probably want some gumboots, but if it's nice and warm, then you can potentially get in there and, and your bare feet and not worry too much. Um, when I go out to a stream, I, all I have to do to look at what kind of invertebrates are present are uh, pick up a stone and I can usually see them. But sometimes it can be a bit challenging for other people to actually find them. So a useful trick is to have um, some kind of white tray or uh, a white ice cream container. Pick up some of the bigger stones that have, you know, hopefully some invertebrates on them maybe a little bit of detritus where those invertebrates might be. And then you can dunk that into the, the white tray or ice cream container and hopefully all the, the little invertebrates will pop off that and you can see them much more easily. You can also um, sample them with a net, um, hunting and fishing and places like that have nets. Or you can even just get uh, a little, uh, you know, one of those little nets that you can get from the aquarium fish shops. Um, they work perfectly fine, they're just not very robust. If you have kids, I strongly recommend taking them along. Um, I've done lots of uh, trips out with school kids and lots of trips out with farmers. And I think, I don't know whether it's a smaller size of kids to farmers, but they can certainly see the invertebrates much more easily than I would say the average farmer can see. So if you've got some kids that are that keen on, on looking at things in your stream, take them along because they'll probably be able to see the little invertebrates much more easily than maybe you will. Next slide. So here are some more questions again. These relate really to the stream banks in the area upstream uh, of the site that you would be looking at for the invertebrates. Again, a uh, number of questions and then those multi-choice answers where you go through and you circle which one seems most appropriate. In this case, there's examples of the riparian strip um, along the right there. You can see that the top right, um, some really nice riparian forest along the edge of the stream, either in a QE2 Covenant or a scenic reserve or something, um, going down to an area that's obviously been fenced off and planted up by uh, the local farmer, where you've still got uh, a good riparian area, of a reasonable width. Until you finally get down to the, the last slide there on the right, where there is no riparian strip, um, Although the, the farmer has fenced it off and stopped animals from 
getting into the waterway and creating lots of muck and um, defecating as they often do. The riparian strip is absent. It's not really stopping any of the nutrients or sediment from actually flowing along the paddock and getting into the waterway. And in fact, they've even sprayed the grass along the very narrow edge of that uh, riparian strip. And so there's no riparian strip at all. It won't be stopping any um, sediment or bacteria or nutrients from flowing along the land and getting into the waterway. Next slide, please. You'll also need to look at the stream banks. They're fairly obvious usually. And again, I think whether or not you've got um, stream banks which are eroding should be fairly obvious. Um, you'll see, um, you can see on some of these pictures, the, the stream has gouged into the, the river bank and there's a lot of uh, fine sediment that's going to uh, fall out and get into the waterway um, where it's not good for, for healthy waterways. So quite straightforward, I think, to, to look at all the different stream banks that you might have uh, on your waterway. Next slide. Um, looking at the periphyton, um, as I said before, um, the best time to do this is usually um, during summer or at least after some period of relatively low flows. You don't really want to be going out today after um, you know a lot of the rainfall that we've had around New Zealand that's made the flows in our, our rivers high and it will wash away all of the periphyton. So you're not really getting a very good idea of whether or not there's lots of periphyton growing. Much better to go out during summer um, after a, a reasonable period of, of low flow. And then all you simply need to do is what I call the thumb test. Pick up uh, a stone that you think is fairly characteristic of the green slime that's growing in your stream run your thumb or your finger along the top of it. And if too much gunk builds up on your fingernail, then there's probably too much algae growing in your waterway. And that might be an indication that there are too many nutrients. If you run your thumb over the top of the stone and although it's smooth, um, a little, no, you know, not, not very much gunk builds up on your fingernail, that's quite good. Um, and if you run your thumb over the top and it's really rough. Um, there will be some algae growing there, but those are the kind of substrates, the amount of periphyton that provide a good ecological health for, for waterways. Next slide, please. Probably the best option for assessing your waterway, if you only had to choose one question, is to actually look at the invertebrates which were there. And it's good to see that a number of you have uh, been out and collected stream invertebrates from your sites. Um, the good thing about these animals is that they're living in the stream all the time. So if, for example, there was a, a discharge of some chemical um, in the middle of the night when you weren't out there collecting water samples, it will affect the animals which are living in the stream. If it occurred a week before, you know, maybe you collected your water sample today, but something really bad happened to the waterway a week ago, that will also have affect the animals which are living there. So they're really the best indicator of how healthy an ecological, how, how ecologically healthy a, a waterway is. And we have what are termed good bugs and bad bugs. Um, the good bugs are the mayflies, stoneflies, and caddisflies. Um, I, I like to characterize them as the, the, the crawling swimming bugs. When you put them into your ice cream container, you'll see that they, they crawl around, they try and swim, try and escape from um, getting out of that uh, container. In contrast, if the ecological health of your stream is not very good, you'll have a lot of what I would call slimy, wiggly things. So snails, a lot of worms, a lot of midges. They don't really move around very much. They kind of just sit there and you'll see them. They'll, they'll be wiggling around. Um, they often have a lot of slime associated with them. Um, in terms of water quality, we call them the bad bugs, but it's simply that they're the, the most robust ones. They can survive in really bad water quality. Um, it's not so much that they are bad in themselves. Next slide, please. So uh, along with nutrients, the other big issue that we have uh, in New Zealand waterways is too much fine sediment um, as a result of erosion that fine sediment gets into the, the waterways, it clogs up 
all the stones. It um, stops the animals from burrowing down into the spaces between the stones where they live. Uh, it also affects the periphyton that's growing on the top. It's a little bit like having a, a layer of sand on your dinner at night. It doesn't really provide very good quality food. So a simple way to assess this is to stand in your stream and shuffle around back and forth. Um, the water hopefully will stay clear or it might get a little bit murky, but only for a very short period of time. If like in that bottom left hand corner, the water stays really murky for up to a minute after you've shuffled around, then you've got far too much of that fine sediment and you will have a, an unhealthy system as a result of all of that fine sediment. Next slide, please. However, there are, of course, uh, a number of streams around New Zealand which are naturally soft sediment streams. And this can provide uh, quite a challenge. Um, I think it's important to make sure that you actually have a naturally soft sediment stream. Many of the streams in New Zealand, as I said, have been impacted by erosion from farming activities going back uh, you know, over 100 years. And although you might have been living on your land for the last 20 or 30 years, it might actually have a stream in it with lots of sediment in it as a result of erosion. It's not that, it is a naturally soft sediment stream. So the first thing you need to make sure is whether or not it is naturally a soft sediment stream or whether it's just had erosion going on in it for uh, quite a long period of time. If it is one of the, the soft sediment streams that occurs you know, in Northland and the East Coast, then my recommendation is to simply leave that sediment question out. Um, in terms of the invertebrates for that question in the stream health check, there should still be mayflies and caddisflies. In fact, we have some mayflies in New Zealand which specialize in living in that soft sediment type stream. So just because it's got soft sediment in it doesn't necessarily mean the ecological health is low, but often it is the case that with uh, too much erosion, there's too much sediment going into what was previously a, a hard grey wacky stream. So um, I think to get around the fact that there are a number of natural soft sediment streams, we just leave that question out of the stream health check. Next slide, please. So these are critical source areas. Um, these are probably the most challenging issue that farmers have um, in dealing with trying to improve water quality. Up to 70 or 80% of the nutrients and bacteria and sediment that end up in our waterways actually come from these critical source areas. Um, little dips in the land that at this time of year probably have water in them, but throughout most of the year probably don't have any water in them. And a lot of you will just think of them as, as being land, as not actually being waterways. Um, but as I said, they are supplying, you know, up to 70 or 80% of the nutrients, bacteria and sediment getting into our waterways. And often once it gets into a stream where you've got you know, water flowing or flowing quite quickly, it's actually almost too late to try and fix the problem because it's simply going to wash past. However, um, you, many of you will have on your farm uh, a number of critical source areas that um, occur in single paddocks and Fencing them off is, is, you know, in many ways just impractical. So anything that you can do to, to minimise the amount of nutrients, bacteria and sediment um, coming from these critical source areas um, is a good thing. Sometimes it might be possible to, to fence them off or to at least graze the paddock in a way that means you reduce the, the amount of nutrients and sediment going into that waterway. Next slide, please. Um, as I say, most of you will probably be well aware of these on your land, certainly um, with all the flooding and water that we've had uh, lately, it's pretty obvious to see where they are, you can actually see where the water is. Um, if you're looking during the summertime, you can almost always see them as well, because you've got things like buttercups, which grow more prolifically in those areas, but they're also in the, you know, the bottom of, of valleys of, of ridges on your paddocks. 
as I say, I think you'll you'll be able to find them quite easily. And they're called critical source areas because if you can somehow prevent um, the nutrients and sediment getting out of those, you are reducing huge numbers or huge concentrations of that material that can potentially get into the waterways and, and result in a low health. Next slide, please. Okay, so um, once you've been through all the questions, you've answered or circled whichever option you think is the best one, and then you've added up all the scores, you'll have a, a stream health check score for your um, particular waterway. If it's 250 or more, that means your stream is hopefully pretty healthy. You've been doing lots of good work um, and you can just keep up doing the good work that you've been doing. Um, if it's somewhere between 120 to 250, there's certainly room for improvement. Um, you've been doing an okay job, but maybe there are few critical source areas or maybe a road, um, you know, a farm track crossing the stream, putting too much sediment in. So certainly some options that you can look at uh, on your farm in terms of the way you manage it. And if your score is less than 120, um, the stream's probably not in a very good state. Um, and hopefully it, it's a good um, incentive for you to look at your farm plan or the things that you're doing on your farm uh, to hopefully perhaps change them. As I said, it doesn't always have to be a massive change. Often small changes can actually result in some, some very good outcomes that can improve the health of those waterways. Next slide, please. <clears throat> and just to, to reassure you that um, the Stream Health Check works um, from a, a more rigorous scientific view. Um, this is a plot of the MCI against the stream health check measures that I've done for uh, a number of the sites in, in my Pahongana catchment care group region. We had hoped to do uh, a lot more streams, but uh, the COVID issues over the last couple of years have um, impacted our ability to do this. Um, so on the x-axis is the stream health check score. You can see most of the streams are actually above that 250, so that's good. And then on the, the y-axis uh, to the left, you have a thing called the MCI. So the MCI is the Macroinvertebrate Community Index, and it's a measure of the ecological health based on looking at the invertebrates which are living in a particular stream. You go out, you collect the invertebrates, and each invertebrate has a score with it. You sum up the scores. Uh, the ones that score 10, they're the ones that are living in nice clean water. The ones that have a one, uh, those bad bugs which live in, in more polluted streams. You add them up and you end up with a score. The higher the score, the healthier the stream. So if the score is above 120, that means a really good healthy stream. If it's below 80, it means that the stream's in really poor condition. And you can see here that the, the MCI scores from these sites relate very strongly to that the stream health check that I did when I went out and collected water samples for the monitoring. So the stream health check that farmers are using actually match quite closely what regional council scientists would be using to measure the health of these waterways um, as we go, um, as they go around monitoring uh, waterways. Right, next slide. So I see we've had a few questions in the chat. Yep. So um, I'll go to Lisa's first. So Lisa has asked, do CSAs have to obviously run into a waterway or stand alone? Um, I guess they're going to be having um, an impact on your waterway if they're running into uh, the stream. If they're stand alone and the, the sediment and nutrients coming from those are not getting into the waterway, then it's not going to be an issue for the health of that waterway. And the other one, which Fran has suggested saving until the end, but we might as well cover that now as well. Um, a colleague a colleague mentioned a stream with naturally high phosphate levels. They were talking about how to lower the phosphate levels. They wanted to do this because it was having a negative impact when it combined with a modified low flow stream. What are your thoughts on this? Um, there are a few streams around New Zealand which have naturally high phosphorus and or uh, nitrogen, and they often 
um, uh, draining from, from wetlands. Um, I guess my inclination is that if it's naturally high, I'd be inclined to leave it. Um, if you do want to reduce phosphorus, then you know preventing the flow getting into that waterway um, is a, a a good way of preventing the, the phosphorus getting in there. If it is, for example, coming from a wetland, then maybe you can plant uh, more plants in that wetland, which will reduce the amount of phosphorus that might be getting do getting through into the waterway. But as I said, I'd, if it was natural, I'd be inclined to, to leave it as being natural. I'd Does Massey offer any short courses on this um, and fresh water, water, fresh water monitoring and freshwater species? Or do you know of any distance papers, not a full-blown degree to upskill a bit? <laughs> um, so Massey does have the nutrient management um, short courses, and they do now have the freshwater farm plan um, course, but they are much more focused on managing the land. We don't have any short courses around identifying freshwater invertebrates. Um, we did actually used to run them about 15 years ago when we used to do much more um, short course um, engagement. Um, so no, we don't really. Um, the probably, I mean, unless you're really interested in freshwater invertebrates, in which case there are a lot of good resources online, you don't need to be able to identify all the different invertebrates to assess whether the, the health of that waterway is good or not. So um, it really depends why you want to learn um, how to identify all the freshwater species. But there are definitely some really good um, resources online. If you Google uh, the Manaki Whenua website, the Landcare website, they've got some amazing photographs of many of the different invertebrates that we encounter. Um, and that's probably the best way to, to learn how to ID the different invertebrates. OK, so say we do uh, assess our waterway, we find that it has a really low score. And so what we want to do is, is then put in place some strategies to improve that, that score. And that, I suspect, is what MPI will be looking for, that you identify the state of your waterway and then you come up with a plan, a farm plan or farm environment plan that is going to do something to try and improve the situation. So what you do is you go back to the stream health check assessment you look for answers to questions where you've circled on the far right, so the really low scores. So in this case, we might have sampled grazed pasture and grasses and many large gaps. We've identified twos and those. And you can see in the column next to it, the A, D, E and F, they refer to letters in the table, which is also online at Beef and Lamb or in that environment plan freshwater module. So if we go into the next slide, I'll show you the table. So this is an excerpt from table 2.1, the risk factors. So you find your stream's got a low score, you go and find out what's causing that low score, you identify an A and a B, you look down into table 2.1 and you see A, so obviously there's too much deposited fine sediment in your stream. It gives you a little bit of information about sediment and why it's an issue, but then it highlights some on-farm risks that might be leading to the high levels of fine sediment that you're recording in your stream. So hopefully there you can identify key things on your farm that you can hopefully integrate into your farm management plan to hopefully ensure that the fine sediment getting into your waterway is actually being reduced. So maybe not allowing the heavier stock to get near your waterway, maybe it's stream bank erosion, or maybe it's like, uh, as in the case on my land at the moment, there's been a big landslip, which is now pouring lots of fine sediment into my little stream. And it's really challenging to actually know what you can do about it. So. The idea is to identify what the potential risks are and then hopefully what some of the solutions are that fit the situation on your farm best. And then you can develop a plan to um, actually try and mitigate those strategies and then, of course, monitor that in time. Um, any changes that you do are not going to result in the stream changing dramatically overnight. It's going to take a year or two years or maybe even 10 years if it involves planting up riparian edges. So 
you need to have a little bit of patience, um, but at least if you know that there is a particular issue, you can develop um, a plan which deals with that particular issue rather than just randomly trying to solve a problem like riparian planting if you might not even have a, an issue in your waterway. Next slide. And as I've mentioned throughout the talk, um, all of these uh, things are available on the Beef and Lamb website. There are even some nice videos of me collecting invertebrates and, and looking at them. Um, the farm plans are also available there, as are uh, lots of information about catchment community care groups. And certainly if you want to set up a catchment community care group or if you want any other uh, information around farm plans and what you can do, um, there are the, the Beef and Lamb Extension Managers, which are useful resources uh, as well. Next slide. So that's it. Um, as I said, um, most of you will be well aware that uh, we have um, at least public concern around the, the state of waterways on our farms. And as a result, the government is um, pressuring farmers into um, reporting on or doing things about that. Um, and so we believe at Beef and Lamb that the Stream Health Check provides uh, a relatively easy way to go about doing that. And as I said, it seems to be, you know, nicely related to the more scientific measures that cost a little bit more that you can do. I think really to me, the key thing is that not only does it assess your waterway, but it also hopefully identifies what the issues might be and then allows you to link that to actions that you can take on your farm to actually try and improve things. So rather than just saying, oh, a stream is bad and leaving you at a loss about what to about what to do about it. It says, oh, your stream is bad. You've got too much sediment. Maybe you need to, you know, stop stock um, accessing the waterway uh, just upstream from where you're sampling. Um, so hopefully um, this provides you a, a little bit of an overview um, and uh, you'll all get out there and, and try it. Uh, it's really easy to do, as I said, um, and won't take too much time. Uh, and then from that, hopefully you can see whether you need to be more concerned and, and do more um, around trying to uh, improve things if, if you need to. Thank you very much for your time, Russell. Obviously, it's great having an expert such as yourself um, developing a tool like this and, and supporting people through it. Um, so a big thank you um, for, for uh, joining us today. Um, and a big thank you to everyone attending um, as well. It's really great having you all on here. And I've actually just had a quick question come through. So how big should the area be to assess along the stream? Um, between 25 to 50 metres, really. Um, it doesn't need to be excessively long, but just a length of stream, you know, where you can get in and look upstream and downstream. Looking upstream is the key. Um, you can see the banks quite easily and you can see the, the stream substrate. So somewhere between 25 to 50 metres is, is a good ballpark. Perfect, thank you. And I haven't had anything else pop in. So um, thanks again, everyone, and we'll see you on the next one of these.